If you would, and you want to follow along, please look at Romans chapter 10. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read the first four verses. Beginning in verse 1 of Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Uh, I entitled this, Is Christ the End of the Law? Now, I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to make an assumption that all of you people here know the answer to that question. Because it's an emphatic no. Not the way people talk about it. But that's what I entitled it. Because it is a question. Uh, by way of introduction, I do want to put this out, if I can. I was talking with my wife in the kitchen the other day. And for being an apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul sure writes a lot about Jews. But that's okay. He is one. Let no one debate his honesty here. Paul said his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I believe that to be as true as everything else the Apostle Paul wrote here under the inspired inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let no one doubt his sincerity. <laughs> sincerity. He had a big desire to see Israel, the Jews, my kinsmen after the flesh, to be saved. Paul preached to the Jews first. Then you'll read in Acts 13, it was when he went to the synagogues where there was one and he preached. He went to Antioch and he spoke in the synagogue and the Gentiles asked that he speak to them the next Sabbath. And Paul did. The Jews then were envious of the multitude, contradicted and blasphemed against the Paul, things that Paul said. And Paul said, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now that's in Acts chapter 13. Now I've heard people talk like, okay, that's it. Paul, Paul became the apostle to the Gentiles and he didn't talk to the Jews anymore. I mean, that's the impression you get. But if you read on, you'll see in Acts 14, in Acts 17, in Acts 18, Acts 19, and Acts 26, where Paul went to synagogues after that in different places. Paul never ignored or avoided preaching the gospel to anyone, Jew or Gentile. Paul went to the synagogues, but Paul preached to the Gentiles. He included them. I was going to say he went out of his way to preach to them, but that, no, that was his way. He preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to whoever would listen. And he said this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And it should not come as any surprise because it was consistent with his ministry. I want to see God save my kinsmen after the flesh. Because they were just like I was. Paul, then known as Saul of Tarsus, was a Jew on his way to Damascus looking for believers to put into jail and to send bound. Jesus Christ delivered him from that. 
And he wanted the same thing for his brethren, his kinsmen after the flesh. Now these, Paul said, I bear them record. They have a zeal of God. They were possibly, I remember Earl used to talk about this all the time. They were possibly the most religious people ever lived on this earth. Dedicated, thorough, active toward their religion. Their zeal was not their problem. But they did have a problem. But it wasn't their zeal. Their problem was his next statement. But not according to knowledge. They had a knowledge problem. They had a knowing problem. Zeal of God is good. Zeal toward God is good. However, their knowledge was sadly, sadly lacking. Now, I will be one of the first that will tell you knowledge does not save. Christ does. Let's be clear about that. Knowledge doesn't save the man Christ Jesus saves. However, I will also tell you this. If you know the man, you're going to know some things. He's going to see to it. His spirit will see to it. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. And guess what? He's going to teach you. That's what he said. If you know him, what you know is going to change. And what you know changes only because of who you know. It's not what you know makes it so that you know who. No. It's who you know changes what you know. I got to keep it in the right order. Because Jesus Christ himself said in John 17 verse 6. I'm not going to turn to it. That he came and manifested. This is in his high priestly prayer to the father. He manifested the name of his father. What? To the ones that the Father gave him out of the world. It was manifest to me. He made known. He made known the name of the Father to his disciples. Our Lord gives understanding and yes, knowledge. You won't know any you won't know everything, but you will know someone. And these Jews, what they're ignorant of, it's Paul's fixing to tell, they were ignorant of Jesus Christ. They were ignorant of Jesus Christ. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. These Jews in Paul's day, did not know God's righteousness. This is plain. This is plain. And this is where Paul starts out with their problem. They did not know God's righteousness. They had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. So where was their knowledge lacking? According to this, it's lacking in the knowledge of God's righteousness. Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. Amen. Our righteousness is a person. Our righteousness is in a person, but our righteousness is a person. And these Jews did not know him. How is that shown? Well, being ignorant, they're going about. <coughs> See, this is where zeal toward God can get you into trouble. If you're ignorant of God's righteousness, if you don't know Jesus Christ and if you don't know God, because if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can't know God. Christ told me, says, he that's seen me has seen the Father. There's no one coming to the Father and then, oh, discovering Christ. It doesn't work that way. No, sorry. He doesn't work that way. 
Our only avenue to the Father above is through the Son who came below and went back. They thought, though, they could establish themselves as righteous before God. Being righteous before men is not a problem. Lots of people fake that. Lots of people fake. All you have to do is be fairly secretive. And I'll think pretty good of you. It ain't going to do you any good, but I'll think pretty good of you. But establishing a righteousness before the holy God, the holy, righteous, vengeful God, that's a whole other thing. They were ignorant of God's righteousness, not man's righteousness. And they were going about to establish their own righteousness because they were ignorant of God's righteousness, our Lord Jesus Christ. They tried to establish themselves as righteous before God and it won't happen because it can't happen. It never has and it never will happen that a man will establish his righteousness his own righteousness before God. And they were going about it though. They had their doings and they had their not doings. There's some supposed stuff they did and there was stuff they didn't do. But here's the key. Here's the key. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, what does it say? They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And that's a key word right there. Submitted. Submitted. Let's make this clear from the beginning. The true worship of God is what Paul said this morning. In spirit and in truth. Now, whose spirit and whose truth? His spirit and his truth. It's not my spirit and my truth. It's not your spirit and your truth. It's not what I think. It's what he said. It's not what I want necessarily. Because I didn't want it at one time. But true worship is in submission to God in submission to sweet little Jesus. You understand? The world around here, they want to push Jesus around. And they think they can. You know why? They're ignorant. They're ignorant of God's righteousness because they're ignorant of God. And they're ignorant of God because they're ignorant of Jesus Christ. No one pushes Jesus Christ around. Nobody crucified him until he led him. Nobody killed him. He laid down his life. And he laid it down, what? For his sheep. For the sheep. But the world thinks they can push him around. That's ignorance. I'm telling you folks, that's ignorance. That is rank ignorance. Oh, if I come, Jesus has got to accept me. Oh, do. <laughs> do tell. Is that what you think? It's what the world thinks. And I'm talking about the religious world. I'm not talking about the secular world. They don't think nothing about him. Been there, done that. But the religious world says, oh, God's got to accept you. Why? Because God is love. Yes, God is love. But yes, God is holy. And yes, God said, I will in no wise clear the guilty. But Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sheep. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. And they go about to establish their own. Why? And because it shows they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. In true worship, we submit ourselves to Christ. To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Because there is no true worship without submission. That's the whole. We're saying he's God. What does that make us? 
We're down here. We're in the mud. At best, we're earthen vessels with his riches inside. At best, Isaiah said it, my righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. That's the best I can do. And yet here they're going about to establish their own filthy rags. Go figure. And I love what Daniel Park said about that Walter. He said, and they put them on and wear them. And say, look at me, God. And say, Jesus has got to accept me. No, you're still wearing filthy rags. His righteousness is the only righteousness that matters. You will not submit until you know you have to submit. And then you will. Then you will. And you will not submit until you know you have no righteousness. Or the righteousness you have is filthy rags. I got nothing to brag about myself about. Though I... Earl told me we were having lunch in the old building at Mabscott. And Earl told me one time, he said, a preacher had said, you can't love God unless you love yourself. <coughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I looked at Earl and I said, he said that? And Earl said, yeah. And I said, Earl, the only part about me that I love is what Christ has done for me. What Christ has done in me. And he said, I know. <laughs> it's hard to get away from the flesh. You got to fight against it. Mortify the members. And that tongue is the unruliest member of them all sometimes. They did not submit themselves. They would not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God which is in the face of Jesus Christ just like the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ Walter preached on this a while back but seek ye first the kingdom of God what and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you now this is the generation 2000 years ago or so when Paul was preaching and I said it this morning it's exactly the same in our generation today and really if you want to know the truth about it that's the truth of every generation because it's the truth of the fallen man that he thinks he can make himself acceptable to God we're that bad. We're that bad. I got to watch for it myself now. Preachers have to watch for it constantly. Because you don't want to get puffed up because maybe you preached that you thought was a good message. And maybe it was. And if it was, it wasn't because of me. But everyone has to watch for that. But these people, these Jews, are just like the people around us today. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. You listen to them on the television, you'll hear it. And they're going about to establish their own righteousness. And if you listen to the television or the radio, you're going to hear it. They've got their doings now, and they're not doings. Both. What do they call that? I don't know what they call it. I call it works. And I know from his word that salvation is by grace, not works. And if it's works, it ain't grace. And if it's grace, it ain't works. And never the two shall mix. Not for salvation. Now, because of salvation, there'll be some works. Because of salvation, there'll be some understanding. Because of salvation, there'll be some knowledge. 
grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But grace always comes first. There's no difference. And I said it. What are they ignorant of? Well, that's the wrong question. Who are they ignorant of? Who are they ignorant of? That's the question. Paul answers at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Who are they ignorant of? For Christ. Christ, the righteousness of God. I'm going to start with this because it's a, it's a definite negative and I've heard it and I assume possibly you have and maybe you haven't but there's a partial quote here. It's part of what I call chicken theology. They'll say, for Christ is the end of the law and they'll put a period right there. Well, Paul doesn't put a period there. Well, there's no punctuation in the Greek. But it doesn't matter. That's not the end of the statement. But it is for some people. Because they quote this as a support for their theology that the law is done away with. We're in the age of grace. You understand? The age of works, the age of the law is done with. We're in the age of grace now. That's what they talk about New Testament times. I've heard that taught. And they're teaching it today somewhere. I guarantee it. They quote part of a statement and they ignore the rest. Just like that, I told you about that chicken out there. That pan plumb full of corn. And that chicken jumped up in that pan and he started kicking out every kernel that he had. Until he was left with one in that pan. I don't know how that chicken got all that pan out. Emptied. But it, and then they ate that one kernel. And kicked all the rest of it outside. They'll take this one piece of scripture, one part of a verse, and they'll build a doctrine around it. Or use it to support a doctrine they have. There is no more law. There's only grace. Christ did away with it, and now you just have to believe. Because they're teaching now that the law is null and void. And it's not. That's not what Paul wrote here. This is a partial statement because they leave out that, that one word that means purpose. For Christ is the end of the law. What? For righteousness. Now firstly, the word in here translated is the noun form, the original form of a very famous word that is used in the scriptures. A very famous quotation of Jesus Christ when he said, it is finished that's what this word end here is. It's just, that's the verb form. It is finished. This is the noun form which the verb is derived from. Jesus Christ is the finish of the law what? for righteousness. He's the end, the finish, the completion of the law for righteousness. Now notice also very carefully, this is not saying what Christ did, although he did it. This is saying what Christ is. He is. He is. Not saying he did, although he did. What Paul's writing here, he's the finisher of the law for righteousness. The finisher of the law for righteousness is a person. It's a Savior, a Lord, the Lord from glory, the everlasting, well-beloved Son of God is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He's the finish and he's the finisher. Yes, he did perform the law. Yes, he kept the law perfectly. And yes, he is the finisher of the law for righteousness Amen. to everyone that believeth. The law is still the law. Everyone that believes 
Everyone that believes. That's the way Paul narrows this down. Everyone that believes, you are under grace and not under law. The law is still the law, but you who believe are not under it. Why? Because Christ is the finisher of the law for righteousness. We have, believers have, the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. He is our righteousness. Of God are you in him. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. And it also says, God has made him unto us, unto us, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's our righteousness. God made him our righteousness. I didn't make him my righteousness, Walter. I didn't make him my wisdom, Mac. I didn't make him my sanctification or my redemption. God made him. God made him. And you know what? When God makes something, it's made. That's exactly right. It's made. Whether you feel it or not, he's our righteousness. If you believe. Whether you know it or not, he's our righteousness. Mm, I want it that way. I want it that way. I, I can't have anything dependent upon me. Please no. I mean, I do the best I can with what I got, but I don't want anything dependent upon me. I can't take it. Because I can't do it. You are righteous in him and you can claim it if you believe. If you believe. If you believe. If you have submitted yourselves to the righteousness of God, who is Jesus Christ. You are under grace and not under law. All right, I just got a few things I want to say here as a sort of a conclusion. He is the righteousness of God. And the law hasn't gone anywhere. Romans 3.31 puts it this way. I said it purposely about they want to make the law null and void. Because John, uh, Paul wrote this in Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. Yes. Yea. We establish the law. That's what grace does. Grace doesn't do away with the law. Christ did not do away with the law. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believeth. That establishes the law as the standard. God's the standard. But the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. Now we are none of the above. But the law is holy. And the commandment's holy. And just and good. What? And God is holy. And we are holy in Christ. He's our righteousness. He's our righteousness. God can look at me and see me holy as Christ. Perfect. I still don't understand how that works. I'm just glad it does. That's the great. I don't have to understand it either, Walter. I just got to believe him. And we believe that Christ is the finisher of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. But here's some things. The law is not for justification. I'm not going to go into it. It's in Romans 3 and verse 20. <laughs> Take a look at it. The law is not for righteousness before God. Oh, that's Romans 10, 4. The law is not even a continuation of faith in Christ Jesus. 
That's in Galatians 3, verses 1 to 3. The law is for the believer's knowledge of sin. That's Romans 3.20. Also, the law is our schoolmaster to what? Bring us to Christ. To bring us to Christ. The law is not our schoolmaster to stay under. When you're a child, you're under teachers and governors. When you grow up and become a man, sometimes you become a teacher. David's one. But the law was our schoolmaster to what? To bring us to Christ. How? Through the knowledge of sin. The law brings us to Christ, points us to Christ, and shuts us up to Christ. Because we cannot keep it. In Christ, believers are dead to the law. Romans 7. I do want to look at that for just a minute. Verse 1 to 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law, the Jews, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if... While her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. By the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. Very carefully. The law is not dead. We, believers, are dead to the law. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Believers are married to another. Jesus Christ our Lord. And we are not under the law. That's the two dominions Paul gives here. Either you're under the dominion of the law or you're under the dominion of Christ. And if you're under the dominion of Christ, you've submitted yourself unto him. Why? Because he made you. He made you. You were willing to do it, but he made you. Because you weren't willing before. Come on, I've been there, done that. I wasn't looking for God when God found me. I didn't care anything about God when God found me. But he cared. And whom the Lord loveth, he saves. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, what? With loving kindness, I have drawn thee. And that is drawing a bucket out of the well. There's resistance. There's weight. A dead weight until he gives you life. But if he loved you, he's going to draw your, you to him. We are dead to the law for the express purpose of being married to another. Christ. And to live in Christ is to be dead to the law. The law's not dead, but we're dead to the law. We don't become dead to the law to be able to live in Christ. When we live in Christ, we're made dead to the law. Here the apostle was using an illustration of a husband and wife to illustrate the removal of the dominion of the law. Paul is not illustrating the removal of the law, just the dominion of it. Because the law didn't go anywhere. We did. We did. We're in Christ now. We're not under the law. The law didn't go anywhere. We did. Paul wants his brethren now to be saved. Why? They're still under the law. They're thinking they're keeping it. They're not because they're ignorant of God's righteousness. The law didn't go anywhere. 
we did. I think that's one of the best things I can think of. We are dead to the law by the death of Jesus Christ, his body. Is Jesus Christ the end of the law? No. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. We are not under the law anymore if we believe. He is our husband. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for this time, this place. Most of all, thankful for you. Be with Walter as he comes to speak. Give us ears to hear. A message to be heard. And thank you, Lord, for the love of you through your Son. In us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.